Salon in honor of Diane Cady. Dan has written an important new book, The Gender of Money, Value and Economy in Middle English Literature. And we are thrilled that she agreed to launch this salon. The format of the book salon, which we will be holding annually, is to bring a Mills author or artist together with their peers. We will hear from Diane, followed by our panelists, Professors Kirsten Saxton and Awan Mass. Mans, sorry. <laughs> After hearing from our panelists, both of whom also have questions for Diane, we will open up for audience Q&A. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Diane and our panelists. Diane Katie is a professor of English at Mills College. She holds degrees from Portland State and Cornell. She's particularly interested in the links between pre-modern culture and today, and has written on topics such as language and disease, poetic reputation and masculinity, and gender and economy. In her new monograph, the gender of money, she explores the foundational role that gender ideology plays and the ways in which we understand money and value today. Kirsten Saxton is a professor of English at Mills, as well as an alum from the class of 1990. Her scholarly work focuses on how reading 18th and 19th century texts through anti-racist, feminist, queer and crip theoretical positions offers us productive ways to understand not only historical texts and contexts, but also our own cultural moment. Her writing is centrally concerned with embodiment and gender, often as it is formally represented in popular narratives from the 18th century to the present. Her scholarly books include a monograph on the murderess, a collection on early British woman writer Eliza Haywood, and a 2019 edited collection on teaching entitled Adapting the 18th Century, a Handbook of Pedagogies and Practices. She's a founding editor for two scholarly journals and runs a mentorship program for women and non-binary scholars in her field. As an Oakland native, she's particularly delighted to be part of the We Are the Voices Mellon Project of Oakland Arts with Awan, Professor Stephanie Young, and me. And Awan Mance is a professor of English at Mills College. She holds degrees from Brown University and the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. In both her scholarly writing and her visual art, Awan explores the relationship between race, gender, and representation in the lives of Black people. She is the author of two scholarly books, Inventing Black Women, African-American Women's Poetry and Self-Representation, 1877 to 2000, and Before Harlem, an anthology of African-American literature from the long 19th century. So Diane is going to start and we will then move on to our panelists. Thank you so much for coming. Great, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you, Sheila, for that lovely introduction and for everyone being here uh, on the eve of a truly momentous election. I was telling my partner I've bit my nails to the quib, which sure as many of us have. So uh, nice to have a little bit of intellectual change, uh, exchange, I should say. Um, maybe change to uh, the night before uh, the election. So because I'm going to read from uh, the code of my book, I thought it might be useful to just tell you a little bit about what the book is about, and that way it'll kind of contextualize things. Um, and it's specifically how the book sort of relates to what I'm going to say tonight about issues of masculinity and economy. The primary argument of the book is that gender ideology plays a pivotal, although unexamined or underexamined role in the ways in which the West thinks about money and gender, or excuse me, money and value, I should say. And here, I'm actually not talking about the very, very real effect that among other things has on individual economic lives or on economic policy, but rather how gender ideology plays what I consider a constitutive role in the very structure of money and value as it's conceived in the West. So put another way, the ontology of money um, is something that is very much inflected by gender. 
And the ice work traces actually go back to the Middle Ages. It's perhaps hard for us to imagine today, but money actually didn't always enjoy its specialized position. Uh, in fact, up until the century, currency played a relatively small role in the medieval economy. And this changes uh, around this period, in part because of the international trade, some other events that take place that I'm happy to outline if uh, people are interested. Um, but with this change um, and this emphasis on international trade, there becomes a, a desire for a kind of more portable way of exchanging goods. And of course, money then uh, plays a role in that. Um, and alongside that, uh, a lot of new questions develop about the nature of money. Interestingly, you know, we talk about kind of some of the abstracted ways in which we do banking today. They were very much the same um, in the Middle Ages. And those of you who've read Marx, you know that Marx often uses religious imagery to talk about the faith uh, that one has to have in money and the economic system in capitalism. Uh, that same language infuses the Middle Ages as well. And alongside this emerging uh, monetized economy, uh, develops these new questions about the nature of money. Now, if we were in the 18th century, we would turn to political economy. In fact, that's what we do today when we have questions about money, questions about economy. But medieval writers did not have recourse to political economy because it's a discipline that's invented in the 18th century. So what is a medieval person going to do? What I argue in the book is that medieval writers and thinkers draw on a kind of ready vocabulary that is gender as a way to understand these new fears and fantasies about money that are emerging. And the book talks about that in a number of different ways, but I'll just give you two quick examples. Uh, one is that medieval writers and thinkers often describe money and women as having a similar character. Of course, I'm using that word deliberately. One marked by instability and exchangeability. And uh, interestingly, Aristotle is in influential here, both in terms of his theories about procreation and his theories about economics. Another example is that wealth the, and the possession of wealth is often equated with heterosexual possession, specifically a man possessing a woman, and poverty with emasculation and coquetry. And again, this is something that I explore throughout the book. At stake, I argue, in these instantiations is a form of analogical logic that relies on naturalistic claims about one realm to buttress naturalistic claims about another. Uh, put another way, the fact that money's nature is like a woman proves for many medieval writers that money is something that needs to be controlled. And the fact that women's natures are like money proves to many medieval writers that women need to be contained and controlled. And so in a sense, you see this kind of cross-pollination um, where the supposedly debased nature of both women and money is strengthened through uh, that connection and supports arguments for needing to be tightly held by men. And of course, this is reinforced by the fact that starting in the Middle Ages, the very notion of masculinity gets very intimately tied with wealth and good husbandry. What I think is really fascinating about medieval text, and this is sort of what got me along this road um, in the first place, is that the linkages between gender and money are very much on the surface. There's a promiscuous commingling between gender and money in a way that seems bizarre to many of my medieval students, or my students in my medieval classes. Why is the discussion of money suddenly veering into a discussion of lechery or how did, why is sodomy uh, appearing in this discussion of usury? Um, but um, what I argue in this book is that we really cannot understand medieval ideas of economy without looking at gender, that the seemingly gender neutral discussions of money have a lot to tell us about medieval gender. And I think gender has a lot to tell us about medieval economy. So if you don't look at the two together, you're missing something really crucial in the other realm. Um, I already mentioned uh, that political economy is an 18th century invention. 
and Vivian, of course, Kirsten is the expert here uh, that I would uh, defer to, but I think she would agree that the 18th century is a period that has a penchant for separating knowledge into dis different discursive categories. And so what happens in the 18th century is that anything having to do with money, interest, value, sort of gets thrust into political economy. Domesticity in the 18th century becomes sort of the realm of thinking about gender. Um, and it's one of the reasons I think that a lot of economists pretend, not all economists don't, Room, but many economists act as if gender, if, if uh, economy or the study of economy is gender neutral. I think this has more to do with the separation of economy in the 18th century. Um, but another point that I make in the book, and this is what I'm going to be speaking about today, is that gender ideology still lingers, albeit often in occluded ways, in how we think about money and value today. And so um, we really need to excavate the role of gender as a way to understand not just economy, but sort of the, the epistemology really around economic ideas. This brings me to Donald Trump, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but before I begin, I just have to say this book came out in October 2019. Can we say that it's a year, but it feels like a century? I mean, so much has happened in this last year. Um, I was just reading over the code and I was just thinking, but, but what about this? What about that? And it's really made me think about the pandemic and economy and the ways in which class and race and gender all are kind of functioning today. Maybe we want to talk a little bit about that. I hope you a heads up that there is some discussion, or at least I mentioned uh, sexual violence. In I just want to tell you about that I do. And I, I would just note here that in a lot of medieval discussions of value, a woman's body is often very central. And a lot of times the body is either violated or is threatened. And as we're going to see, uh, that's not so different from what's happening today. So with that, I'll just read a little bit from the coda, it's pretty short. Um, much like the late Middle Ages, America finds itself immersed in its own age of anxiety. And like the earlier period, much of that anxiety centered on money and economy. Only recently has the U.S. emerged, and for many sectors and people, is emerging still from one of the worst, um, excuse me, from one of the worst economic crises since the Great Depression, a crisis that has altered profoundly how many people view money, value, and economic security. Some of the financial realities of today, such as dark money in politics or banks that are too big to fail would be foreign to a person living in the Middle Ages. Others, like a lack of access to criminal justice for those without money or a lack of a living wage, would be all too familiar. In the US, there's been a seismic shift in the job market in the last 17 years. Labor has become more specialized and technologized, requiring college degrees or advanced training. At the same time, there's been a significant loss of manufacturing jobs in the US, from 5 million since 2000. Some of these jobs have gone overseas, others have become obsolete or redundant due to technological changes and advances. Alienated labor is nothing new, of course, but in a world where corporations have become people, workers perhaps feel more acutely and more consciously the fact that they are commodities. Such a moment was ripe for the election of a president like Donald Trump. After the election, many pundits and critics wondered, how could someone like Donald Trump be elected? How could someone who filed bankruptcy six times or if you follow President Trump's calculations, he counted the first three as one filing, be seen as a successful businessman? How could someone, women, when and where he wanted, be the leader of a country composed of over 50% women? How could someone who spoke in such openly racist ways about African Americans, Mexicans, and Muslims be the leader of the United States? But these questions miss the point. Donald Trump was not elected primarily with business acumen, his reformer streak, or his views on women and minorities. Rather, it is because he embodies fantasies about money and power, fantasies that deploy the tropes of wealth, sex, and ideology in the ways that I've been sketching in this book. These tropes proved to be particularly compelling in a time of rapid economic change and anxiety. As Mike Conskill observed, during the election, Donald Trump always scrupulously avoided criticizing the rich. There were corrupt players, media, politicians, lobbyists, many of whom had money, 
But having money was not in and of itself something to criticize. Donald Trump understood that wealth is something that many people aspire to. With his penthouse dripping in gold and white, not unlike Triamore's tent with the lavish gold eagle with a ruby eye, is a, from a, a text that I discussed, Sir Long Paul, Donald Trump represents a kind of exotic caricature of wealth. And at the same time, with his love of meatloaf and KFC and his ill-fitting suits, he seems like a regular guy to those who support him. Along with the other markers of wealth, Donald Trump has a beautiful wife. As noted earlier, this is a necessary accessory for proving one is worthy, both economically and socially. The display of such a woman is an important part of the worth-building project, hence Lafayette's challenge. He possesses the most beautiful of women, but he cannot tell anyone about her. And of course, having a woman who is more beautiful than another man's becomes a way not only to solidify one's own work, but also to emasculate other men. We saw this with King Arthur, who is angered more by the idea that Longfall's lover is more beautiful than his wife, than the idea that Longfall raped her. We saw a person came and emasculate him by circulating side-by-side -side pictures of Heidi Cruz and Melania Trump with the caption, quote unquote, the images are worth a thousand words. Owning beautiful things, including women, is a sign of wealth. In an interview with Larry King, Donald Trump said that Angelo Angelina Jolie is, quote unquote, not a great beauty, something that he claims to have a particular expertise on. Quote, I do own Miss Universe. I do own Miss USA. I mean, I own a lot of different things. I do understand beauty, end quote. This commodification might be understood as a form of containment. It turns a woman into a good rather than an actor who possesses goods. Thus, Donald Trump noted, quote, I would never buy Ivana any decent jewels or picture. Why give her negotiable assets, end quote. That is, why turn her into someone who owns goods rather than someone who can be owned? One needs to contain these beautiful women and a certain kind of marriage, once circumscribed by traditional gender roles, may serve as the perfect container. In another interview with Larry King, Trump states, quote, the way I look at it, there's nothing like a good marriage and there's nothing like having children. If you have the money, having children is great. Now I know Melania, I'm not going to be doing the diapers. I'm not going to be making the food. I may never even see the kids. She will be an unbelievable mother. I'll be a good father. Melania will stay in the home while Donald Trump will be out in the world. Like the ravishing appeal of Lady Mead. This is a, a allegorical figuration of money uh, in a poem called Pierce Plowman. She's both beautiful and um, dangerously seductive, and she represents, uh, again, money. Melania will be contained within marriage and the house, brought out only for orchestrated displays. As noted in the previous chapter, commodities are passive things according to Karl Marx, which, quote, lack the power to resist men, end quote. We might think of this justification of force alongside Donald Trump's bragging, that he can grab any woman at any time and anywhere that he pleases. While many people found this comment repugnant, it offers an idea of masculine privilege and economic power that is appealing to others. What I am suggesting is that when we think about what is happening with the atrophying of women's rights in the United States, the virtual impossibility of getting an abortion in many states now, the attempts to defund Planned Parenthood, the claims by Breitbart that birth control makes women fat, unattractive, and promiscuous, the Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, whose primary defense when accused of sexual assault, that he was, in Chaucer's words, a worthy man and went to Yale. We can and must think about these situations as fundamentally misogynistic, but they are also economic. To be a commodity is to be feminized, to be taken to market rather than taking things to the market or taking them from the market, as Karl Marx described. Perhaps then, in a world where many men are feeling increasingly commodified, there is a dark comfort in keeping women as commodities rather than as powerful actors in their own right. It is why at this particular moment, regardless of what one thinks about Hillary Clinton, she ran, it is not surprising that she would not be elected. It is depressing, but not surprising, that as with Lady Mead, the cry was, lock her up. It is perhaps tempting to conclude that the United States finds itself back to a medieval way of thinking. Such an idea is appealing in a world where medieval has come to signify any behavior or mode of thinking that a society wishes to distance itself from. Thus, ISIS has been described repeatedly by media and politicians as a medieval organization, 
despite its very modern, even ultra-modern origins. But what I wanted to suggest in this book is that we have inherited from the Middle Ages an economic foundation that is deeply steeped in gender ideology, even if political economy tends to insist that economics is a discipline free from the taint of gender. Excavating that history enables us to better understand what Marx calls the borgesic of money, its shadowy prehistory. But perhaps more importantly, it exposes how analogical logic works how it attempts to shore up naturalist claims while simultaneously, like all ideology, folding in on itself. As Jean-Joseph Gu has argued, the only way to exit from metaphysics, if such an exit is possible, is to launch a fourfold challenge against patriotism, phallocentrism, logocentrism, and monetarocentrism. But in a way, it requires tracing precisely how the father becomes the general equivalent of subjects, the phallus, the general equivalent of objects, the spoken word, the general equivalent of language, and money, the general equivalent of commodities. The gender of money in the Middle Ages provides an example of the effectiveness of analogical logic as well as its frailties. An exploration of the gender of money exposes the vulnerability of the sign and challenges its hegemony. That is a project that not only enables us to better understand the medieval past, but also seems particularly pressing today. Thank you. Here's Diane, that was so fantastic. Um, now I just wanna have a conversation, but we're supposed to say things. So I'm gonna say my things, um, but I love that. Um, so first of all, I just wanna say that I have loved talking with Diane about this project um, through many stages of its iteration and reading it. And it's really exciting. Like, have you seen it, everyone? Like, look how great it is right here. You should buy it. Um, <laughs> so um, the book um, is a really generous book as well. And I think it's important to note it's generous as well as learned, right? So those of you who know Diane will understand how appropriate it is to praise her scholarship in those terms. Um, often folks who are seen as, and I think right now the way I'm talking is actually using the language of economy, right? Your generosity is not promiscuous, right? It's in fact generous um, as well as learned. And in, in the middle of saying that, I realized how much your ideas have inflected my own ways of understanding, not only my own teaching and my own scholarship, but the ways in which I use language at all, which is the best compliment, right? When somebody's ideas actually change the way that you think about the world that you're in. Um, even in the moment of trying to like talk about things, you already wrote. Um, so I come to the book as a non-medievalist, and my particular focus has been on the ways in which Diane maps an extraordinary um, genealogy of gendered economies from the 14th century through to the present. And particularly, just in the shortest thing to go back to a point she made, she lets us, in fact, she forces us, although gently, um, to see the ways in which how discussions of economics and political value are not neutral on gender. Um, and specifically, and I'm going to skip down because I want to hear from Diane, I mean, from Awan and more from you, but um, the ways that we think about gender of money and value are not only neutral in praxis, but they're not neutral in representational aesthetics, which is really fancy sounding, I realize. But in other words, I think my point there is that what I love about your work is that you're talking about the ways in which that ideology works its way out formally, right, as well as through um, other means of operation. So I was thinking a lot about the um, introduction where you talk about Schwarzenegger's comment on girly men. Um, from the 2004 Republican convention comments. And I want, for those people who haven't read the book, Diane does a wonderful job of thinking about um, the ways in which anxieties about money um, create a kind of anxious interest with that wonderful pun on the term interest, right? As our interest in something and what is interest in the economic sense. Um, and I think I'm just gonna skip to my question. Um, we are, the book really lays bare a rhetorical history that is just foundationally racist, sexist, violent, misogynist, homophobic in terms of the ways that political economy um, is imagined. And I feel like your coda really clarifies how that analogical logic works today. So if we have time, I'd love to hear you talk about it like this in this week. 
But I actually really also want people to understand some of what you do as a medievalist in terms of your really provocative and brilliant readings of medieval texts. And in that point, my question would, would be, would it be possible for you to talk a little bit about my very favorite chapter, chapter six on the man of law, which is the chapter in which you move out the discussion into how the storytelling itself, right, becomes imbricated in this sort of mm -hmm gendered economy. And I feel like um, there you really take on the Chaucerians, you really make people think in new ways. And I'd love it if you would just share a little bit about um, about your ideas on that chapter. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for those nice words, Kirsten. Uh, Kirsten, just to modest to tell you that the book would never have been written without her and a wand, by the way, she both uh, pulled, prodded, and uh, provoked me into writing uh, when I had my uh, moment. But uh, The Man of Law, I mean, this, of course, Chaucer, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, a very um, canonical work. And uh, those of you who uh, maybe are unfamiliar with the text, it's a series of stories told by a series of group of pilgrims who are traveling um, to go see uh, Beckett's um, uh, relics uh, in Canterbury. And uh, The Man of Law is a lawyer. And he tells this story and he prefaces it by saying that there are no good stories left to tell because Chaucer, albeit lewdly, which interestingly means unlearnedly, so thinking about language, um, he uh, has told them all. And so, you know, he's kind of left to tell these crappy stories. And um, he has this very, um, some people have argued, kind of zero sum uh, understanding of storytelling, that there's only so many good stories and if they're told too much, they have no value. And um, I, uh, one of, you know, people um, have often excoriated the, uh, this narrator for this point of view, but my question was, why is it that we are assuming that how the man of law is a, a character who's supposed to be satirized, maybe Chaucer is talking about certain kind of economic storytelling and that we're trying to kind of protect Chaucer from that. So anyway, um, in this uh, chapter, which is kind of lengthy, I do this whole reading um, where I bring in a bunch of discussions that are happening in the Middle Ages about uh, specifically about storytelling and how it's linked to a kind of merchandising. So you use rhetoric as a way to sell text. And the way that you sell those texts, um, and those of you uh, who are familiar with Latin, you know that corpus, the word corpus, it's literally a body, but also a book, um, is to um, kind of expose part of the story, but not to tell too much. And um, when you read it, when you see these descriptions in the Latin, often um, they are described, and again, here's the language of violence, um, in a way where that advertising is sort of putting onto sexual display a woman's body. And there's also a lot of issues around nationalism that I talk about in that chapter. But um, when I first started publishing this work, I remember um, a rather curmudgeonry. <laughs> uh, Chaucerian said to me, well, how do we know that Chaucer thought that way? And my riposte to that was, how do we know how Chaucer thought at all? So I'm always a scholar very interested in um, why are we not asking, why do we ask certain questions of text and why don't we ask others? So instead of asking why is it that the man of law has this economic view of storytelling? Why don't we ask, what is it that Chaucer is saying? Or what is Chaucer revealing about the economics of storytelling, its implication with nationalism and with gender ideology, and his own kind of anxieties about his own poetics and his own masculinity? Thank you so much. I think I'm just going to uh, move it to Awan right now to give her a chance to ask her questions, um, and then you can just go. Um, so Awan, thank you. Okay, um, I hope I sound normal um, in terms of my microphone. Um, but Diane, first I, I thank you for your reading. That was really great. And um, I, it's been really exciting to see this book coming to fruition, and then to get a copy in the mail. That was really, really wonderful. Um, and so I just want to say congratulations on the publication of this book. It's, it's very unique. Um, it's, it's, it's really an outstanding study. Um, and you've accomplished, I think, in this book, 
this, what for me at least is a rare feat, and that is kind of introducing these really interesting analyses that are very rooted in uh, your discipline, but in a form that's, that, I, that feels really accessible to me, even to those who don't have experience in the field. And I say this as an Americanist whose area of specialty is the literary history of the Black 19th century. Um, I rarely encounter the texts about which you're writing in this book, uh, but the clarity of your voice is such that just a few pages in, I immediately started thinking of how this kind of sheds light on the mid 19th century that I write about and think about. Um, and so um, those connections are the focus of the comments that I wanna share very briefly today. Um, and one is, um, you know, when I was reading your introduction, Anxious Interests, uh, this quote kind of stayed with me, um, that the focus of this book is on how dominant Western theories about the intrinsic nature of money and value are intimately tied to its beliefs about gender and gender difference. And then a paragraph later, you go on and you link the rise of these beliefs to several events, um, including but not limited to, because you list others, but in particular, I was interested in this notion of the increase of urban markets and a rise in population. Um, and this was really interesting to me because it brings to mind for me the shifts in conceptions of gender and labor in mid 19th century US society, particularly among the white upper and middle classes. Um, and although the shifts in American notions of gender took place on the other side of the Atlantic, as many as 700 years after the rise of the use of money in medieval England, these changes were, um, these changes in the relation under notions of gender and labor were related to increasing use of money um, and the meanings of money. And so, um, you know, as I'm sure many are aware, this was the time period that saw the redefinition of work and home in ways that reflected the embrace of two emerging definitions. One that understood work as activities that earn money and the other definition was of home, particularly the middle and upper class white homes as places of respite and sanctuary. And so defined as such, none of the activities that took place within the home were considered work, including things like household maintenance and child rearing. And so, um, and then the, the other thing that really occurred to me, um, you know, reading poetry as you do, I thought that, you know, just as the poems you address in your book, US poetry during the mid 19th century, and we see this money related shift in understandings of gender and its relationship to work and money. Um, uh, you know, the poems of this time period in the US also, were one of the places where you could most clearly see this um, prevailing understanding of the relationship between gender and money. And so I just thought it was, you know, there's these connections that were so clear to me. Your arguments were very clear and really compelling and just make me think about the roots of so much that we saw in the 19th century and so much that we're seeing right now in the time period about which you're writing. And so that was really exciting. And, um, and so this sort of kind of leads to my question. Um, and so my question to you is, um, you know, in the conclusion of your third chapter, you address issues of class, gender, and social mobility. And so I'm wondering, um, if you can link what you find in the Lady Mead episode um, to that you're, which you're close reading uh, to conceptions of social mobility in the United States today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, and um, thank you, nice comments. I really like, you know, those linkages are really what I like and what I strive for as a scholar. I think, you know, we have this tendency to kind of different fields, but there's so much, you know, legacy that travels across them. So it's so interesting to think about that. And, you know, you yourself are such a good um, literary historian. So um, I, I really, I think that compliment um, quite, quite the heart. Um, you know, with Lady Mead is such an interesting comment. I don't know if any of you have read Pierce Blount. It's a long allegorical poem. It's sort of a cross between, um, I don't know, a sort of a travel narrative and a, uh, an allegory. And it has a little bit of a, a kind of a feeling of um, Pilgrim's Progress to it too. Uh, and uh, this figure, Lady Mead, is herself this quite beautiful um, woman, very wealthy, who then represents money. And she creates a great deal of anxiety 
anxiety among people um, and with many men trying to contain her through marriage. Uh, and uh, because she is just hanging out with priests uh, in Rome with the corrupt uh, papal court, and she is, um, you know, causing all kinds of havoc. Um, I think one of the links that I see today is this tendency to, um, I mean, when you think about allegory, allegory is not about individual. Um, we can't hear you. Okay, I switched computers. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. You can. Okay, great. I'm so sorry. I don't know what, exactly what happened there. Um, I don't know how far when I broke out, but I was talking about allegory and representation, and I was just saying that on the one hand, you know, an allegorical figure is a personification, but you know, when I was um, studying allegory as a graduate student, not with my wonderful professor Christine Rose at Portland State, but with some other people, people tended not to look at gender or race in representations of allegory and, you know, would tend to just kind of see them as somewhat neutral, but I don't think that they are. And I think that um, often what you see is the kind of projection onto um, allegory, uh, certain kinds of anxieties. So for me, it makes sense, for example, that Lady Mead is uh, feminine, that she's beautiful, that she's seductive, that she's dangerous and powerful. And I think, you know, going back to what I was talking about with the coda, um, I think that that's part of the, the anxiety that is sometimes circulating around powerful women today or women that are deemed to be powerful because to be economically successful is deemed to be something masculine. So, you know, in, in medieval texts, there's what's called the virago, the um, hyper-masculine woman um, seen as kind of problematic. And I think today we see something very similar where um, I mean, I even think about an Awan, I don't know um, if this gets to what you were talking about, but just the other day when Trump was talking about uh, to uh, suburban women, you know, as if it's a one unified group and saying, I got your husband's jobs back, right? This idea that, you know, women are somehow still sitting at home um, in the domestic space and their husbands are the ones who are, you know, sort of bringing home the proverbial bacon. Um, there's just something very bizarre about that. Um, and I'm sorry, Awan, I maybe, uh, maybe I'll let you drop in here because I think with my change of um, computers, I may have lost the track of what I was saying there. So I don't want to babble too much. Maybe you can, you can throw me a line here if I'm getting towards what you were kind of thinking about. No, I think this is all related. I mean, this notions of social mobility in the U.S. and how some of that, you know, what can we learn from, you know, Lady Mead? Where do you see the connections between what's going on then, um, gender money and social mobility, and what's going on now? Yeah, thank you. I needed that pickup because when I changed computers, I lost. I think, um, I think the ways in which um, social mobility in the Middle Ages was seen as some something potentially dangerous uh, because it um, it called into question certain ideas about place and propriety. I definitely think that it's very much the case today. It's okay for certain people of certain identities, 
white cisgendered men to have property. Um, and, and that is indeed essential for a definition of masculinity, which of course is very problematic um, of how it emasculates people who don't, men who don't have property. But if a woman or a person of color or a queer person has that same kind of property, I think it can be deemed um, as something not just uh, dangerous or inappropriate, uh, but but potentially um, it's a kind of zero sum game so that it's taking away um, from, um, from the people who, the white men who are supposed to have it, it's somehow taking away from them. And that idea of social mobility is very much in play in the 14th century. Um, again, this idea that there's only so much to go around and um, if women or if um, minorities or other people uh, get some of that property, get some of that wealth, they are taking it away from the people who supposedly have um, the most right to it. Um, and so I, I do think those issues are definitely in play. And I would just say one last thing about Lady Mead too, the way that Lady Mead becomes um, responsible for all the evils, she's surrounded by men, and yet she's somehow responsible for all the evil that is caused by money. I think there's something similar in the way in which we characterize certain people, certain groups of people, and you know, put the blame, and by we, I just mean from as a cultural, as a from a cultural perspective, and place the blame onto them for uh, for all of the kind of economic ills and sort of social and um, ills. You know, right now we're in a moment where uh, we have become acutely aware of the cracks in our social infrastructure, in our public health, and it is really interesting to. See see the ways in which um, the blame game uh, is circulating. That's very familiar to me as a medievalist. Thank you, that's great, thank you. Okay, um, although we were scheduled to end at 4.45, I think we should oh. take some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, just let me know and I can unmute you. I'm looking. Is there a way to raise our hand? Oh, Louise, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes, there's a reaction. Um, yeah, this. I just would like to comment, and maybe a question to Professor Katie. Hi, this is Louise Leck. Um, Hi, Louise. Thank you for your um, wonderful presentation and and. Um, other professors. Um, I, I can't help but think um, uh, of your last comment there in, in um, thinking of um, the way in which Kamala Harris has had to thread the needle in her candidacy for um, vice president, if you care to comment about that. I think that's a great connection, Louise, that you make. And it's a great example of, you know, <laughs> as I always say, the privilege of privilege is to not think that you have privilege and to not have to be aware of it, right? And so, um, you know, the ways in which, you know, we were watching the, uh, the vice president debate and the ways that, and in fact, Awan's class had a really fantastic discussion of this that I was, had a chance to witness, the way that Kamala Harris had to navigate uh, her speech and, um, you know, it, that uh, Pence could interrupt her constantly, rudely, and yet she had to be very careful about the ways in which she checked him and also she herself had to be very careful about interrupting him. So I definitely think, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of similarities. And in the book, you know, throughout, I talk a lot about sexuality and I talk, I, I talk a fair about, bit about nationality, which um, because race signifies a little bit differently in the Middle Ages compared to how um, we understand it today, although not as differently maybe as we might think. And so, um, yeah, I think that, that that's a great example of, you know, Kamala Harris, I mean, like you said, threading the needle quite literally, uh, trying to, um, you know, be strong and yet not appear too strong, don't appear like a virago, you know, because not only being a woman, but being a woman of color, you know, there's already an assumption that she's aggressive, that she's angry. 
um, et cetera. So definitely, I think that's very true. Other questions? Hi, Diane. This is Maya from many, many, oh, many hi. years ago. <laughs> hi, Maya. Hi. So nice to see you. I saw your name and I had to show up. So it's, it's lovely to see you again. Um, you I have a couple of not particularly scholarly questions listening to this wonderful uh, discussion in your book, but I was wondering if you were going, if you addressed um, the role of the church and women with money and, you know, were they an easier target to get money out of because they were the ones that were kind of used, I guess, to recruit and to shore up the, um, not the parish, but the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted. Well, I, I think that they had, they were easier to control. And if they had money, they were much a much more uh, um, uh, successful way of, of browbeating and, and threatening. And so I was wondering, I'm sorry, uh, I was wondering if you addressed that and if you addressed sex workers and the fact that, that sex workers are blamed for what they do when their clients or their johns are never looked at as the problem. It's always the sex worker that is the problem. So these were two things I was wondering if you addressed because they both deal with, with money. Yeah, I thank you for your question. I mean, interestingly, I'll take the sex one first, uh, because <laughs> you almost don't have a discussion of money in the Middle Ages without sex somehow appearing, um, whether it's uh, usury uh, being kind of understood to be uh, you know, a form of, of sodomy, which is an utterly confused category in this period, as Foucault would say. Um, but I would say in terms of talking about sex workers or even talking about uh, women in the church, this book is taking a slightly different turn in the sense that a lot of the work in my period focuses on women's economic lives. So there actually are excellent books, and I can give you some suggestions if you're interested offline about sex work in the Middle Ages and about women, and specifically the rise in the uh, vilification of consumption during this period, which uh, the sin of luxuria starts to be feminized in this period in ways that I think speak to certain kinds of uh, neo-capitalist anxieties. But where I, I take a slightly different shift with this book is I'm less interested, I'm not, in, not uninterested, but the book is not really taking up women's economic lives, but rather this isomorphic link between gender and um, economics, specifically that I think that's that was for me the, the place where I could make a contribution because um, any discussions of economics and gender tended to look at women and what women experienced. I was sort of interested in why the vocabulary of gender ideology was so imbued in economic discussions. So, um, but there is really good work on both of those subjects. And like I said, if you want to drop me a note and I'd love to catch up with you anyway, um, I can send you some good uh, links to some things if you want to read about those two topics, which are very interesting. Yes, please. Thank you. And there's a question for you in the chat from Angela. I'm currently okay. working with a student on the Canterbury Tales, which you mentioned. Oh. I'd be interested to hear your take on the night's tale. And when you say take, what I think of it, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a potentially large uh, question, Angela. I love that you're working on the Canterbury Tales. I mean, the night's tale is really fascinating. Although in all of the manuscripts, the uh, tales appear in different, um, uh, different orders. It's always in all of the manuscripts, the night, the miller and the reeve. So the night always begins. Supposedly they draw straws and the night wins, but most scholars think that probably Harry Bailey, the ta tavern owner, uh, 
arranged for it to be um, so that the knight could speak because he would be seen as the most worthy man, you know, in Chaucer's parlance. The Knight's Tale is very interesting. It actually is um, uh, an analog to one of Boccaccio's tales. And um, I tend to read it as like most things queerly, uh, I tend to read it in terms of East Sedgwick's ideas of triangular desire, Palamon and Arcite, these two cousins who happen to fall in love with the same woman, um, Emile, um, who herself is sort of commodified in um, pretty kind of horrifying ways in this tale. Uh, I think it really is more like most romance about their relationship uh, than it is really about the relationship, the heterosexual relationship. I was just telling my students, I teach a class called What's Love Got to Do With It? About medieval romance. The short answer is not much. So most romance is really about homosocial desire um, and um, heterosexuality is pretty decentered. So um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, there's some good work that's been done recently on The Knight's Tale. And if you wanna talk offline, you know, I can share, um, or, you know, I'm sure Sheila could share my email. I'd be happy to chat with you about it. And, and depending on what your student's interested in, uh, there's a lot of different directions that you can go uh, in with The Knight's Tale. Take one last question. Going once. Okay. I don't see any other questions and nothing in the chat. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, if you're interested in contacting Diane, go to her faculty page on the Mills website. You can find her there. And Diane, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful book. It's quite provocative and daring in many ways. And Kirsten and Awan, thank you for your responses. Those were quite nice. And um, I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your evening, wherever you might be. Great. Thank you, everyone. And sorry for the technology difficulties. I guess that's the moment we are living in right now. So feel free to drop me a note if anybody wants to chat offline about anything. Okay. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.